You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So we had a gathering of uh, our Patreon family the other day, uh, and Avi Chowdhury said to me, it seems that just about every week nowadays, some rock legend shuffles off this mortal coil. And it, it's not just it seems like that, Mark. It's got this age where it definitely is like oh, that. Oh, it really is. It? And we'll get, obviously, we'll get more so. Yes. With all the generations, I mean, it's going to get a point where it's going to be three a week, isn't it? I mean, it just is, you know. Yeah, and I suppose the latest one is is Denny Lane. And um, I actually saw Denny Lane with the Moody Blues. You did, didn't in, you? In 1965, I think, in 1965. On you would have been, what, 14, probably? I was 14? 14, yeah, coming up 15, something like that. Yeah. Do you know why they were called the Moody Blues? Do you know that? No, oh, go God. on. Okay. They were uh, initially named the M&B5 because it was an attempt to get sponsorship from the local brewery in Birmingham who, oh, were, of course, wow. who were, of course, Mitchell and Butler's. Yeah, and yeah. They, they were not successful in getting the sponsorship, but they adapted that to the name the Moody Blues. And oh, uh, I never knew that. And, of course, uh, I think the second record, they, they came out on Decca, which was which was often a dicey thing in the 60s. You know, Decca a bit hit and miss. But anyway, the second Moody Blues album, uh, single, Go Now, which was a, their version of a Bessie Banks hit, an American hit by Bessie Banks, went to number one. Note Very, for note copy. I went back and listened to it. Isn't it just a note to note? That arrangement, it, it is. It? It's out to be. Yes, it is. With that definitely. opening bit, the, yeah. the unaccompanied dum, voice. Dum, and, dum, and, dum, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, uh, but Denny Lane had a terrific voice. I mean, really, Fabulous. really good singer. Also looked really good. It's kind of interesting that he originally had a, had a band called Denny Lane and the Diplomats. Can you imagine a more early 60s title for a group than Denny Lane and the Diplomats? Rather than well, something... Brian, Brian Hines and the Diplomats, because that was his real name, That, wasn't that, it? that was his real name, <laughs> yeah. name, you know, going to shrug off being called Brian and yeah. call, my, call myself Denny. And because uh, he left the Moody Blues... Not that long after that, so he was never there for that kind of, uh, well, that their, 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 their grand period when they were making those extraordinary concert albums and so forth and Nights in White Saturn and all that kind of thing. He'd, he'd, he'd gone by then. and um, But he made a single as a, as a solo uh, performer. Although I think it came out as the, as the Danny Lane uh, or Dele- Danny Lane and the Electric String Band, he made, he wrote and recorded "Say You Don't Mind." That's a great is, record. Which is, of course, a song everybody knows still to this day. Yeah, but it was Electric never, String Band also a bit of an ELO forerunner as well. Very they, definitely, Electric String. They had uh, very, you know, a cello, I think, did they? Had five. Very definitely. You yeah. know, it was uh, it was that kind of. I think it's what they would now call chamber pop. Yes, you know I mean? yes, yeah, true. All those genres, all those genres, uh, t- the titles of which are always generated years after the event. You know, nobody at the time was calling these things chamber pop. It's like 40 years later, it's a, it's a feature in Mojo. Or That's right. You know, it's chamber pop, as if we all knew what it was all about. But Say You Don't Mind was a terrific record. It's fantastic. But, but was not a hit. And uh, so who had a hit? Was it the zombie? Somebody? No, did. it was Colin Blundstone. Colin Blundstone as a, as a solo. You know, I think it was on his second album. Was it something? Like yeah. That? And uh, and that was a hit, although not a huge one, but it, you know, a respectable hit. And it's a fantastic, fantastic record. Both versions of that. And then he kind of drifted around, and was, he was actually a member of Ginger Baker's Air Force. Do you remember Ginger Baker? And he missed balls as well, wasn't he? <laughs> well, he tried was he to get a super group with Jackie Lomax and Alan White and people, wasn't he? Well, Scott no, Nowhere, no, Steve no, it was Steve Gibbons and uh, God, I think was Trevor Burton out of the move involved in it. Yeah, he was. There, there, there were various efforts to put together a kind of. I mean, this is very 1968, 69. You've got to have a super group. You know, you've got to get in some amazing guitar player and a spectacular drummer and so forth and form a cream type you know, super group. And um, 
their idea was if it was going to be called Balls, which I have to tell you was quite a racy idea back in the day. <laughs> Very bad idea, actually. In, not a, in terms of radio play, I would have thought, but anyway. I, and Yeah, true. And I think they made a single called Fight for My Country or something like that, and um, they did nothing. And so he, he moved on out of there, right? but was, of course, a member of the, the serried ranks of Ginger Baker's Air Force, which was one of the most, one of the most populous groups uh, in popular music history, unless you count Keith Tippett Centipede, who really <laughs> did have thousands of members. Um, but Ginger Baker's Air Force had about 20, didn't they? Oh, God, yeah. Steve Winwood, wasn't it? Um, well, he had again, two Alan White was- Two permanent members, Ginger Baker and Graham Bond, and then basically all their mates and everybody they recruited at the pub and so forth. And anybody who could, uh, could hit a tambourine or bang a bongo in the London area was a member of Ginger Baker's Air Force. Anyway, Danny Lane was, uh, was one such member, and he was in there for a few months, I think. <coughs> And then how did he get asked to join Wings? Well, he got asked to join Wings, I think, because McCartney loved Go Now so much, wasn't it? Didn't he just really love that vocal and think that was possible? And he must have run into him at some stage. But he did, and he was there a really long time. Wasn't he there longer, you were saying, than, than, um, <coughs> than McCartney was in the Beatles? I can't remember. It's so he time, joined Wings in what, 1971? When's the yeah, first? Yeah, when it started, yeah, yeah. Is that is 1971 when they do the first Wings tour, or is that the year before? I think it might be the year. Oh, the one where they played the universities in the with well, the band. just turned up, and he was a member of Wings then, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, um, yeah he was. Because that was McCartney's idea. We're just going to take a van, and we're going to turn up at colleges, camp, the campus, and say, we want to play tonight. And it wasn't really as simple as that, was it? No. Um but he was there, you know, all the way through Band on the Run, obviously. And, of course, you and I, when we heard the sad news of his passing, we did the immediate audit that we do from time to time, which is how many members, how many people pictured on the cover of Band oh, on the God, Run. Oh, God, I know, because, well, Not Parky died only this year. It's Parky, Kenny Lynch, James Coburn, Clement Freud, Christopher Lee and John Conte. And obviously McCartney, Linda and Danny. And now there's only John Conti and Paul McCartney left. There you go. John Conti actually relatively young. I think he's in about 72. John Conti also, interestingly, comes from Liverpool, I think. I think I'm right. He does. And uh, so the two Liverpoolians left. And uh, But, of course, he he wrote and co-wrote, you know, songs on Band on the Run, didn't he? And uh, But it must have been an odd relationship with... Uh, with McCartney, would not they? very odd. Oh, my God. <laughs> they must have both, I think, on both sides put up with an awful lot, don't you? <laughs> I suppose I so. But there was, I mean, he did give him a credit for, uh, is it Mulligan Tyre? Mulligan Tyre. So he gave him credit because we don't know. Did he give him a credit because McCartney had put the group on hold for a while and he had no kind of current employment for a while? Or did he feel bad that he would... Mistreat him. I mean, we have absolutely no. I'm sure he probably contributed to it. No, he but, talked but to him. He talks about Mull of Kintyre. Yeah, but he wouldn't necessarily. Bear in mind, when you have a share, doesn't always mean a half share. No, that's true. No, would, that's true. Would you share. take ten percent of Mull of Kintyre? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no that's problem true. at all. Yeah. I would take that. You know. So we always assume that when credits are shared, that they're they're shared equally. Yeah, and, yeah, that's um, true. But but he was there for a long time, and I think he they fell out over the um, when McCartney went when they went to Japan and McCartney was uh, arrested, wasn't he over? Um, he went to the cooler. He was. <laughs> he was in the cooler. The only time in his life, rather touchingly, I think he was separated from his wife, from, wasn't he? From Linda, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, the tour was knocked on the head, and. Uh, and so if you're a Danny Lane and whoever else was in the, in the group at that point, you wouldn't be very pleased about it, would you? Because your means of support r- had rather gone. And so they fell out then and I think didn't didn't talk or didn't, well, didn't run across each other for, for quite a long time. But there was some kind of um, making up not that long ago, apparently. And so McCartney issued a statement. Um, no, it's very the fond of what he said. Yeah, it yeah. was good, and he did say that they they patched it all up, which is a, which is a, it's comforting. 
Yeah, yeah. And of course, the thing we didn't know until Alex told us is that Danny Lane had a son called Called Lane. Lane. And we we immediately thought it was called Lane Lane, as in the kind of the great tradition of people like Jerome K. Jerome and Ford Maddox Ford, people who have the same Christian name as surname. That doesn't mean Diz Dizzly and Woody Woodward, you know, these people actually christened with that name. But he didn't know because his name was Hines. So Lane Hines was this boy's name. But uh, yeah, he called him Lane. Extraordinary. And so thinking about um, Denny Lane, I'm sorry, I disappeared down a rabbit hole. Well, I was more than thinking about it. I was reading about him. Because Danny Lee, the Moody Blues, um, one of the figures in their management in the early days was a guy called Tony Secunda. Tony Secunda, a bit of a 60s face, um, very often uh, decorated with an extraordinary Zapata moustache. <laughs> and um, I, I always think uh, Tony Secunda must have somewhere in his life appropriated a warehouse full of um, pinstripe double-breasted suits because all the groups that he was involved in wore pinstripe double-breasted suits because he was he favoured this kind of gangsterish look. And so if you yeah. look at the early pictures of the Moody Blues, they very much look like that. They're very Cigars, cool. felt hats. Stylish, yeah. yes. Yeah, it, it was. It looks rather more sophisticated than most groups looked at the time. And, there, and the other group that he did the same thing with that he's in, he was involved with, but also from the Midlands, of course, the move. And so the move is just emerging, you know, when, when the Moody Blues are, are, are having the, their first hits. And, um, and that led me to looking into the full extraordinary story of the move and Flowers in the Rain, and I hope you'll bear with me, Mark. Well, I love this story. So if I really... any amount of detail. Also, it's shocking now in this day and age of fierce litigation to think that anyone even considered what he did. Tell us what well, he did. So in 1967, the move have written a song called Flowers in the Rain because in 1967 you had to put the word flowers in the title of your songs. You know, it was just kind of de rigueur. It was like the hula hoop of 1967 was <laughs> was to say flowers, you know, because it was San Francisco and so forth. So Roy Wood, who let's not forget, I think at this stage he's 19 years old, okay, so the move are just a, they've had a couple of hits or whatever. He writes Flowers in the Rain. And Tony Secunda is, is old school enough to feel that the release of this single is going to go unnoticed unless he accompanies it with an outrageous publicity stunt. And so to that end, he has heard the stories, and we can tell this story now because all the people involved in the story are safely dead. <laughs> but at the, for years, you couldn't tell this story. At the time, the Prime Minister was Harold Wilson. Harold Wilson married to Mary Wilson, and Harold Wilson's political secretary was a woman called Marcia Williams, who was a, a figure in the 60s and in the 70s, actually. Very, very smart woman. Regarded very smart. The, Part of his inner sanctum. Kind of strategist, wasn't she? Somebody? Absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah, she yeah. was a secretary, as in, you know, standard secretary. Yeah. But also regarded as the most politicalist person in his organisation. and Sounding uh, board. Yeah. And, and a very, very bright. Um, but anyway, there are, there's a lot of talk about Harold and Marcia and inevitably a lot of talk about, well, they're obviously sleeping together. And uh, and um, anyway... It's just sort of 60s, 70s thing, isn't it? You just imagine it, blokes in, sitting in pubs. Well, yeah. you know, they'll be at it. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, and so so Secunda disguises that he's gonna he's gonna put this rumor around in the light of the move single. So he commissions an agency to come up with a little postcard, which is done in a kind of Beardsley esque style, in which we see the distinctive figure of Harold Wilson cavorting on a bed with the distinctive figure of Marcy Williams, while Mary Wilson peeps up. Peeps from behind a curtain, a curtain in, in and, the corner. And, and written on it, it says, doesn't it, in rather flowery writing, it says, disgusting, depraved, despicable, though Harold may be, comma, beautiful is the only word to describe flowers in the rain, which is the most tangential <laughs> connection with this record. It's got nothing to do it at all. Anyway, he does 500, 
500 of these postcards and circulates them amongst their smart set, you know, DJs and journalists and so forth. Somehow this comes to the attention of Harold Wilson, who is the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and you would have thought had other fish to fry. But no, he decides that they're going to be taken to court. And sure enough... I don't blame him. He engages Quintin Hogg as his QC. (coughs) And so the move, 19-year-olds from Birmingham, suddenly find themselves facing what you can only describe as the full majesty of the law, which would be a rather terrifying prospect. They are delivered to court in a red Bentley limousine, which has been hired by Tony Secunda because he thinks, let's get as much as possible out of this. With a result... The but also ju- arrived very much giving the impression they didn't care. Didn't they? <laughs> and they g- gave an interview, and one of them interviewed, and he said, we have no faith in any political science at all. <laughs> so we'd vote for people like Frank Zappa and Jimi Hendrix. So that's which a just, ludicrous which thing Which just to shows you should never vote. Can't never vote, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, anyway, the judge comes down on the side of Wilson and decides that, that they're going to exact the punishment that all the royalties for both sides of Flowers and the Rain, all the songwriting royalties and all the recording royalties, will go to charities nominated by the then Prime Minister, Harold Wilson. And I think the view in 1967 is, well, that'll put a stop to their activities, and and that's got to be a significant amount of money. It might be as much as, ooh, I don't know, £5,000. Imagine that. Well, they duly make this award, and so the money goes to charity. In perpetuity, Mark. There is no no term on this in perpetuity. And, so and, and not like, only is it the sales of the record, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, every time it's played on the radio, it's absolutely. every single aspect Any, of its anything that, power. Anything that comes from it. And let's not forget, this is the first record played on Radio 1 in the UK in 1967. So, you know, it gets included in absolutely every, every you know, uh, wrap-up of 1967. It's also got the word flowers in the title, and therefore it's kind of natural thing for film editors and so forth to reach for when they want to suddenly, you know, put put the action of the film or whatever in 1967. And they've never so made a red centre. They never <laughs> made a red centre. And so in, I think Wilson died in the middle of the 90s, and at that stage, I, I think the Observer ran a piece about this, that it was still going on. And they estimated at that stage, 1995 or six, that that had involved a quarter of a million pounds. Now, take the quarter of a million pounds and probably at least double it, mm. you know, because the streaming world has come along since. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's getting on for a million pounds by now. Can has you gone, imagine how hacked off they must have been? Has gone to... Well, because it's possible that they weren't even involved in the process. They of the, weren't. The, the, they definitely decision about the process. They probably they def- would have said. They, they sure? definitely. They definitely weren't involved. Well, they were nineteen-year-olds. They were green, yeah. you know. And uh, you know, and uh, be, people always underestimate how these things can go wrong. You know that, that, that you can so well easily find yourself involved in a li- in a libel suit. At one stage, Roy Woods has argued. Wouldn't it be better if the money went to at least charities that I personally support, like the Birmingham Children's Hospital that he's been he's been involved in doing some work for? And but no, nothing can change this. This goes on, you know, in perpetuity. In perpetuity, Harold Wilson's dead, and uh, Marcy Williams. Marcy's and Mrs. Text. Wilson's dead, yeah. and Mrs. Wilson not that long ago. She yeah. lived to be a hundred years old. Yeah, she I did. Think, you know. Still and, pissed off about it. <laughs> Well, I don't know whether whether she was or she wasn't, but it's an absolutely extraordinary story of just what can what can you know flow from just some stupid decision, a tiny little decision by some flash git thinking, "God, all publicity is good publicity." Not necessarily, but absolutely all the people. Well, apart from you know Roy Wood and so forth, you know Carl Wayne who sang it. He's he's no longer alive. Um, you know. Uh, most of these people are dead, but this song just rumbles on, you know. And, 
And that's the amazing thing. That's the thing that in 1967, nobody would have predicted that we could be even be talking about it today. But we are. The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. Michiro Ayoama, uh, an extraordinary Japanese musician and an old pal of ours and a pal of the pod, a former colleague at Word magazine, Rob Fitzpatrick, has just written about this man in The Guardian. Very interesting piece about it. He has a unique way of working. Rob, welcome. Tell us about him. Uh, hello, all. Yes, uh, an amazing guy. Uh, Michiro is an amazing guy. He, is, he gets up at five o'clock every morning checks out the football uh, and then starts working. I'm thinking that he probably lives on his own and, <laughs> uh, and doesn't have any kids. And uh, in fact, I know that he does. And uh, so he gets up at five every day, checks the football out, starts composing and then works for hours every day, just sitting in his studio, playing his guitar, playing his synth running it through a few pedals and make, records a new album every single day. Releases and he's done this since the 31st of December uh, 2021. 2021. Now, I make that yeah. 712 albums that it's, he's made uh, since then. It's an extensive catalogue. And, and how, did, how did you come to, how did you come upon this? And what's your relationship well, with it? Uh well, the first time I was aware of his work, I, he would keep cropping up in my, like, Discover Weekly, for obvious reasons, <laughs> because he's got 712 albums. But, and also he fits in a lot with the sort of music I listen to a lot, specifically while working and also sleeping. Uh, so he kept cropping up, and I, I remember looking at his stuff around about six months or so ago and thinking... And not being able to work out whether it was like a real thing or whether this was some sort of AI generated yes. sort of, you know, yeah. nonsense. And then I, I saw, then a new thing came up and I just, and I sort of dug into it a little bit and I thought, and I found out that there had been a couple of little, very small things written about him, a little thing, people sort of talking about him on Reddit, there's a little thing on there. And I looked into it more and I've realized that he was actually a real human being and actually he was really doing this thing. And then I just thought, okay, this is a great story and a great piece. Pitched it and three minutes later I had a reply going, yeah, write it. So yeah, it was sure. like, great, you know. Um, and so I started I started on this process of listening to, I mean, I was listening to his stuff anyway. I started on this process of, of listening to it quite a lot and – uh, obviously, as I say, the piece barely scratched the surface because there's so much of it. But it is really engaging. And I mean, I do, it is very, you know, amniotic sound bath ambient music. It's great for working to, driving to, sleeping to, whatever you like. Um, and, you know, he, he himself says, as he says in the piece, you know, he has like a compositional mold that yes. he sort of fits everything into, records everything, releases everything he records. And I was, I sort of went into it thinking that's an amazing thing to do and very kind of inspirational and admirable. And also thinking, how does he actually do it? And it, because also it's, it's very sort of strictly controlled. Like he released every, every album has eight tracks. Yes. Every album is 20 minutes and 28 yes. seconds long. Same well, that, right. that, yeah. That's, yeah. that is yeah. so Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess that's probably also something to do with that you have to have at least 28 minutes and 26 seconds to be counted as an album by the Spotify algorithm. Oh, right. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm imagining that, but I would imagine that these, the two things are related. Right. Um, and I also, you know, I thought... I mean, I make music as well, and it took us 24 years to release two albums, and it <laughs> takes him 24 hours to release two albums. So I thought, well, that's nice. 
You've got to get up at five in the morning for a start. I start, I start getting up at five <laughs> in the morning. Yeah. So, so uh, Rob, you, you know quite a bit about the world of kind of streaming because you've worked to Spotify in the past mm, and so forth. Mm. Are there any other things like this? Are people releasing music in very different shapes, amounts, frequencies than I mean, they it, used to? I think there's definitely, uh, particularly in ambient music, that there is a... Uh, a, a wave of people who are releasing a lot of music. And a lot of that is because you'll have a lot of people working on their own. You'll have a lot of people who, like Michiru, are uh, independent artists who own their own music, own their own publishing, work through their own label, probably just release things digitally. And so there's no reason for you not to if you want to release an album every day release an album every day i mean but i don't i don't think there's anybody else releasing an album every day um although what so i went into it to thinking this is just a really interesting story interesting guy and also really like how does he actually do it that was a thing that i went to know like how much time does he spend does he can he do anything else yes. you know and but what's what's been interesting from the response to it is that on the evening that I posted about it and it's sort of during the day when it came out, I had a lot of direct messages on Instagram. Not The other thing I learned is that Twitter is dead because it's been like a decade since I wrote anything in The Guardian. And um, you used to get a lot of sort of responses on X. Right. And now nothing. It's just, it's you know, it's... it's uh, That's interesting. It's it's, there's nothing. Where, there. where is Instagram you do? It's got loads. And what I got, I got a lot of responses, DMs from electronic music producers. Well, I say a lot, probably about four. four right. But that's, you know, four or five. That's a lot. People, and all people who I really genuinely like and admire their work. And, uh, and almost to a man, and they were all men, it was a case of it's a long, sort of along the lines of, I could do this in my sleep. Um, <laughs> you know well perhaps we should all do that uh and and i thought well no one's stopping you yes mate. absolutely yeah. you know, it's like mate and it was like well you know he's gaming the system and da, 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 and all that and it's like <laughs> well yeah you know it, knock yourself out you know it's it's like we could all whenever you see anybody doing anything it's like well i could do that well go on yeah, then so but, but also you <laughs> yeah, point you point out in the piece that he is kind of making a living out of this. Isn't making he? a living out of it. He's retired from his full time job uh, at SoftBank and he's making a living out of it, you know, $3,000 a month, two and a half thousand pounds a month, whatever. Um, just, just from mainly from Spotify. Um, and I get, you know, he, I think he, I think he plays live occasionally. I mean, maybe he does something else because that's not a huge amount of money, but it's a, it's enough money for him to just live and work and do what he wants. And his, the audience is growing. You know, so, um, yeah, and he can, you know, I, I love the fact that after this recording an album every day, then he'd sort of have a, an hour or so off and go for a walk and eat something and then do some study. Yes, he's so wonderfully yeah. structured. I love the idea that he watches half an hour of European football highlights, doesn't he? First thing in the morning. First thing, GM up. catch up, GM up, get him in the mood. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But also he yeah. gives each album a different title, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything's got a different title. Most of them don't mean anything. Because I asked him as well. I don't think I put it in the piece because there wasn't anything much to write about it. But I asked him if any of it was sort of AI generated. Because I was particularly thinking about the covers. Because I think if you're doing this every day, you, there's just yeah, no way you can, you're going to yeah, think. Absolutely. You're not going to spend much time thinking about what the covers are. Like. And they do sort of follow a theme. You know, it's often it's sort of, there's never anybody in them. And it'll just right. be like a scene from nature or shot in the gun. And and the title, and he said, no, he does it all himself, but he will be thinking about do, doing kind of AI generated covers because it's just, I mean, the fact that we're talking here now, and he's got there's another album coming out tomorrow. Yes. It's, just, oh, yeah. it's, it's just like but part it, of the attraction must be that that you know it, there are no vocals, right? It's ambient yeah, music, yeah, yeah. therefore you don't. If you have to mm. connect with a personality who's singing and what they're singing yeah. about, who they are. Mm. It'd be very, very easy to go off them after a yeah, while, absolutely. quite quickly. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you would feel like they were sort of impinging on your yes. uh, yeah. mental state. You know, they, they're sort of demanding something from you. They're demanding your attention. And, of course, what his music does, it doesn't demand your attention at all. 
Well, I mean, that's true of all ambient music. You know, the whole point of ambient music is it, is it can it can play and you don't even know that it's playing. And well, I, can, you, I can imagine most of those people don't have much curiosity about him, really, because it doesn't really matter, does it? Well, it doesn't matter. Want, it's, no. Yeah, although I think there's, there's more curi- the curiosity about him and is more that I think probably along the lines of the sort of curiosity I had, which is how does he do this? And mm. so not so much why, because I think it's like, well, why not? You know, yeah, um, yeah. but how, how does he actually physically do it? But so I had a few responses to people going, well, I could do that, you know, uh, 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 so go on then. and then also I've seen a few things sort of online where people have been writing about the piece and going, well, you know, yeah, well, you can do that with ambient music. It's, there's a lot of that. And I think that it's funny because I hadn't really thought about that part of it. I just thought, good for you, mate. Right. You know, you're getting 200,000 listens a month. You make an album every day. You're literally just doing it every single day. You're doing it to no and not making a fuss about it. There's no PR involved. There's no label involved. There's no marketing involved. There's nothing like that. It's just a guy in his bedroom, literally in his bedroom. But the response from these other people sounds like, I, I wish I'd thought of that myself. They're all probably yeah. making ambient music, but they're probably, yeah, yeah. they can't yeah. get any attention. And well, there was any traction. There was a, and also, let's has. not forget, this guy is working really hard. Because yeah, he's, he's working really hard. Every day. He's really it's, disciplined. He's getting yeah. up and doing it. Most yeah. musicians are not doing that. Well, but all, Most of their effort is spent going to gigs or thinking about what they might do. He's but the, getting yeah. up every day and doing and it. And doing it. But also getting up every day and doing it and not thinking, I'll tweak this tomorrow, I'll do this, I'll do that. Okay. But going, no, it's that's it. I'm yeah. going to do it every day. And when I, when I record every day, I'll, I'll edit it down, upload the tracks and that's the album. And then tomorrow. <laughs> and it's, I think, I think a lot of the things I've seen of people writing about it have been people going, um, well, you know, you that's easy in ambient music. You can do that. Or, well, I, there was a good, there was a really int- very guardian kind of, uh, reply to it of someone sort of going, well, actually, um, <laughs> there's a great <laughs> Japanese musician called, you know, whatever who's done uh, an album a month um, for the last, like, year to do it. And it's like, yeah, but that's not... If, if he'd been doing an album a month, I wouldn't have written the piece. That's, <laughs> Absolutely. Not, the whole point of writing the piece is that the guy does an album every day. I love the I, way that Rob... The Guardian Fyler, voice is, is The so Guardian good. voice. <laughs> well, actually... We, well, I, think you, I think you might find guys... I know, no, we, actually, we used to have that word magazine. We used to. Listening. Occasionally, we, if you got very, very sour people writing in, we would read out their things in that voice, which is, oh, I <laughs> think you'll find... <laughs> I think that Black Sabbath produced two albums on Purple Vinyl in Japan. One of the most trenchant pieces of media criticism I ever heard came from Mark Allen years ago, where he said that the secret of the Guardian, the Guardian's attitude is, you know that thing you really like? Mm. It's shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) It's it's either it's shit or it's a con. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that was, I mean, these were, you know, people replying in the comments, right? These were people replying in the comments. Uh, the Guardian were lovely about it and put it in the paper, which was a delight. And he was, I mean, he was delighted. And he got, you know, he got back to me and said, you've literally changed my life. And I thought, this is it. Well, Overnight. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I, you, I don't know how. You wait, yeah, wait until he's on the word in your, you wait until <laughs> yeah. he's on the word in your ear podcast. It really, it'll, it'll all change once oh, again. Yeah, go so, the so just let's talk about for a moment about the, the, the kind of growth of this whole ambient music has been around for a long time. Yeah. Streaming must have changed that. A hundred percent. Go on, tell it us has. about that. Well, it's definitely changed it in a, to a huge extent because what it's done is it's delivered a massive audience to artists that a lot of times would not have ever been available to a massive audience. And so this audience wouldn't aren't going to go out and buy a no. thousand ambient albums but there's so many places where that you know, where that music works and so there you know sleep playlists are huge you know and like chill playlists and work playlists and focus playlists and things you know these are all massively popular playlists i mean i've got multiple ambient playlists and i play them every single night and I will fall asleep to them. So that means my algorithm thinks all I ever do, which to an extent is true. (laughs) All I ever do is listen to ambient music and then chuck in some podcasts, you know? And so, you know, you've got ambient, like, like Mishiru and like, you know, uh, Chihai, uh, Atakiyama and, and, uh, you know, sort of like in um, American artists, people like Greenhouse and, and just a lot of stuff on sort of leaving records and things like that, where there's this, 
the crossover between sort of ambient and new age. And they are, you know, they're, they're artists that are getting, that are very kind of niche artists in, to an extent, you know, but there is a big audience for them on streaming because their music fits yes. to certain types. You know, it's, it doesn't matter who they are. No, I don't think, I think most of the listeners the, couldn't care less. It doesn't matter who they are, right? No. But the point is, is it works beautifully for a particular thing. You might want to drive to it or you might want, you know, it's great for working to because it's, it's like you've got, there's someone there, there's a presence there, but it's not, it's not demanding. It's not, you know, Bob Dylan demanding your attention with his clever lyrics, you know? Absolutely. So you dabble in this yourself. I do. Tell yes. us about that. Ronnie and Clyde, who I like very much, actually. Ronnie yeah, and Clyde. Terrific. Yeah. Who well, obviously, talking? we in, we invented ambient music. <laughs> Nineteen ninety-four. No, we do. We're, we're not very. We're not. We do have some ambient tracks, but uh, it's more. Um, it's more kind of like samply, kind of not samples, obviously, not anymore, lawyers. Um, but uh, sort of melodic, kind of breakbeaty, kind of. Right. Dubby, melodic, breakbeaty, a bit sort of psychedelic, you know, but, you know, it's gentle, gentle listening enjoyment for the, you know, okay. for the, for the people. So, so broadly, people are really attracted by the idea of music that's kind of soothing, soothes the savage breast, to coin a phrase. Yeah, I think there's that. I think there's all, I think there's that to an extent. And that's particularly, I think, with sort of sleep when people are looking for sort of sleep playlists, but also there is just, there's also just the fact that it's just great to work to, right. As well. So, and like with material stuff, I would have, I've got a playlist of his, which is like five hours and you can leave it on. And it's, and it's a great thing. I, I started thinking about it today. I thought, you know, he could really easily just take a track that he did in, you know, March and yes. whack it on the new. Exactly. Like, who's going to know? Yeah. <laughs> he's going to imagine the sun going to hang yeah. on a yeah. second. It's like, wait, yeah. I, I think I've heard. Deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, dear Michu, I was disgusted to discover on uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine my disappointment. <laughs> on this, After on years of loyal <laughs> devotion <laughs> to your oeuvre. <laughs> yeah. 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 There oh, you go. Dear. He threw it back in my face. Yeah. But, um, no, I mean, uh, you know, it's great. It's, it's, it's uh it's a it's been a funny kind of reaction to it and the fact that it's some people have become annoyed by it and you and i think like you say maybe they've annoyed by it because they didn't think of it but it's not like you can do it i mean whatever people, you know people get annoyed by it. people get annoyed by all sorts but <laughs> the, the fact that the sun is shining the somebody yeah, like the, the fact that the fact that there's something in it that has made people reach out to me and go and feel a bit like, Oof. you know, you go, that's an odd sort of reaction. Like as if, as if there's something that he's done to them personally yes. by sitting no, in his bedroom envy. recording. Um, yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's sort envy. of, they, yeah. They make ambient music and they want publicity and they wish yeah. they thought of this idea. And yeah. they're kicking themselves and they're taking it out on Rob Fitzpatrick. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, yeah. I mean, they're not, they're not taking it out on me, but they were just, they were expressing their, a, a sort of it, it provoked an emotion in I think envy's with some of it and a sort of slight dismissiveness um and it's just like three, you know four or five different people with a similar kind of reaction to it nobody went fucking good for him yeah. I was like <laughs> that's all I thought like, fucking, yeah. what a brilliant guy what well, a brilliant we, guy. Say, you know? well we, we say do. we say fucking good for him <laughs> <laughs> fucking Absolutely. good for him we <laughs> are <laughs> We're prepared to to you know, to say that, and uh, thanks very much to to Rob uh, Fitzpatrick for drawing it to our attention. Rob, all the very best. Thank you very much for Thank having you. me on. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. I can so vividly remember. Um, well, I'm sure everybody listening can actually. Um, the day John Lennon died, I was living in Leytonstone with uh, various people. One of whom was uh, the uh, late writer and a great friend of mine, Tom Hibbert. And Tom was a notoriously bad sleeper and would be a very nocturnal creature. And at five o'clock in the morning, he was downstairs listening to the radio and he came up and banged on my door, and woke me up and said, I've just heard this unbelievable news. And I can remember ringing up my then girlfriend, now wife, 
and telling her this news because he just wanted to tell somebody. You simply couldn't believe it. And he'd heard because it was announced, I think, pretty much at half past 11 uh, New York time, maybe about 12 o'clock New York time, so it was about 5 in the morning. And I remember it so Do you remember that day? My goodness me. It was just... Uh, I, can, just I can remember waking up to the, uh, to the news on the radio. We were, we were woken by a, a radio alarm. And uh, it was John Humphreys or whoever it was. It probably wasn't John Humphreys in those days. In fact, it definitely wasn't. Um, it would be Brian Redhead and John Timpson. Yeah, it would have been Brian. It would. Um, announcing that, that uh, John had been, uh, had been shot. And um, I had just come back from New York. I'd see, Yeah, I'd been in New York just a week earlier. I'd seen... Uh, to, to talk to the police and to see Bruce Springsteen at Madison Square, Square Garden. So New York is very, you know, very much in my mind. And, um, yeah, I remember going for lunch that day with Trevor Dan, I think, and Richard Skinner. And, uh, and of course, the other thing that happened was a... Yes, because Andy Peoples had been in New York. He interviewed him. He, I think did the last interview, didn't he? And he just came probably. back when he arrived, landed yes. at Heathrow. He was met with the news, and probably people thrusting microphones into his face, and uh, and they made a big thing up out of his uh, not terribly overawing um, interview. But it was obviously the last one. Yeah, he was the last. Uh, and um, yeah, and I can remember going through the day, and then that evening. There was a whistle test kind of, uh, whistle, I don't know if whistle test Yeah, chaired, I think, by Annie Nightingale. Is Annie, yeah. Various people came on, maybe Richard Williams, I can't remember now, but people are, maybe Bob, possibly. And uh, and she said, if it had, if it hadn't been John Lennon, many of us would not be doing what we are today. And I remember, we, had, God, we were living in the flat in, in Wood Green, and I went and sat on the side of the bath and I cried. Yeah, no, I understand <laughs> it. I it I'm not a big crier. No, actually. no. <laughs> and, but, uh, yeah, so what is it, 43 years ago? Yeah. Oh my God. It's a lifetime. I remember the interview with McC- Paul McCartney stopped in the street and yeah. he was an heir in Oxford Street or somewhere. And just that kind of that thing he said that has been quoted, um, you know, so often about oh, it's a drag or whatever. He was just obviously in shock and unable to process what he was trying to say. But it it, it made me think that it was, I think, the first of what I would call the the black border music publication covers. Because I don't remember before that that was John Lennon with the dates, wasn't it? You know, and this is a tribute edition. Mm. And before that, I don't remember. I don't remember that happening. And partly because the music press were kind of newspapers, and so when yeah. Jimi Hendrix started, it was a news story. And when uh, you know um, Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison people died, it was it's kind of more news. It wasn't a kind of special issue tribute. But those things proved also to be unbelievably commercial, didn't they? Oh, absolutely. And we were just involved in in quite a lot subsequently, because everybody always feels their warmest towards whoever it is who has just died and it just and wants to reactivate their fondest memory and it's just a place where everybody kind of meets up you know but people and hadn't discovered was. that that point it's um you're you're right that's the point at which it changes because in, yeah so elvis presley had died in 77 in the summer of 77. But wasn't on the cover of time i don't no, know was no it? more than more I, I, I don't know about time America's biggest personality magazine, celebrity magazine, human interest magazine, was People. Yeah. M- massive. And so you would have expected Elvis Presley to have been on the cover of People. He wasn't because the editor at the time didn't think he was quite big enough. <laughs> you know, that he kind of gone off the boil. and And, you know, that is... It seems extraordinary in retrospect, but at the time, yes, you can kind of understand it. You know, whereas post John Lennon, the media kind of decided, "Oh, death! It's good for business." You know, what I mean? <laughs> you know, they they leap into absolutely everything. You know what I mean? Um, and we can still see we can see that going on today. Still, you know, that there was um, there's there's a great there's a kind of 
There's a great celebration takes place after these tragic events, isn't there? You know what I mean? Let's just remind ourselves, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, today, the day we're recording this, just before we started recording, I was looking at the live broadcast of Shane McGowan's funeral, you know, oh, of which yeah. I think Nick Cave and Bono were just about to... Uh, about to perform, you know. Again, that's been rolling on Shane McGowan for a week now, hasn't it? You know, um, you know, and understandably, I think it's very touching. And, uh, yeah. But everybody, it's just everybody, just finds a place to kind of meet up, don't they? Yeah. yeah. But so still touring. On. Sorry, um, we were still touring. Willie Nelson. <laughs> we were talking about Willie Nelson, talking about uh, those getting on <laughs> in the autumn of their years. Willie Nelson, 90 I keep, years I keep old. A bit of a check. I keep having to go back and check this. I think he can't be 90. Yes, he was. Yeah, he, he was is. born in 1933, yeah. which, let's not forget, was the year Hitler came to power in Germany. That's how long wow. ago it was. Yeah. Willie Nelson is 90, and he is... I was looking on his website. He's got a load of dates that start in February, I think. So, obviously, it doesn't work during January because it's a bit chilly. <laughs> it stays, like, <laughs> stays at home, you know, on the ranch or wherever, wherever in, in Willie Nelson has his being. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's probably actually... It's probably fragrant he, pile of herb. He's probably in the Caribbean. Is, is I'm where, sure he is. He's got where, his sense. Where Willie Nelson will be. But anyway... Um, he starts playing in February, and he's got dates. It, it, I, I happen to look. It's my birthday at the end of July, and he's doing a gig. Fantastic. <laughs> at the end of July. That's, I love it. That's seven months away. There's a chap at the age of 90. And do and you know how he starts his shows? It's how he starts and finishes his shows. It's always the same. He always starts with On the Road Again. You know that thing? Yeah, on the yeah. Road Again. Paying my taxes, I'm on the road again. Yeah. Uh, and he always finishes with, roll me up and smoke me when I die. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was, that's just a fantastic attitude, isn't it? You know? It is. And um, and I went for a walk this morning to the accompaniment of, of uh, some Willie Nelson album made not long ago. And I just think, you know, the, 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 the older he gets, the more extraordinary I think he is, Willie Nelson. You know, his voice is just... Still really good. Unreduced. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Beautiful. And just all those, those those kind of intervals that he sings in, a different scale from what most people use, isn't it? And a jazz the, scale. I tell you the thing that struck me uh, today, I was listening to, on this record I was listening to, he does... Um, the Tom Waits, is it a Tom Waits song, Picture in a Frame? I think it's a Tom Waits song. Every time I put your picture in a frame. Um, and uh, he, I can't remember the other songs he did. But he, he can, we talk about tears. <laughs> He's one of the, one of the person, one of the people who's, who's singing can, could make me cry mm. if I was inclined to, you know. And um, he has this brilliant knack when it comes to the middle eight. He seems to just hold off and then go in there slightly late, as if he's just briefly overcome, as if it's taking something out of him that uh, he can't really afford it, you know. And he's an extraordinary... I love people who are that confident that they can, Absolutely. They can move around. I mean, Frank Sinatra is a rather cliche, obvious choice, but anyone who can just move around the beat to that extent. Yeah. Bob Dylan, yeah. too, fantastically. But there's a, there's a performer in... There's a guy in France... But I only found out about recently. It's called Hugh Ofray. Oh right, yes, and Hugh Ofray is a kind. He's sort of in the Bob Dylan category, I suppose. Um, kind of singer songwriter, slightly political, slightly protest kind of guy. Um, and he's still touring. I looked at his yeah. tour dates this morning. He's still touring. He got tour dates booked right into 2024. When was he born? 1929. No, oh, so this guy's 94 years old, and I'm pretty sure. That the guy who is the leader of the Sun Ra Orchestra, I think he's still alive, isn't he? Marshall Allen. Yes. Go I on. think Marshall Allen was is ninety nine years old. <laughs> no, that's fantastic, isn't it? And touring. Oh okay. yeah, yeah, they're touring. <laughs> that you've got to admit, that's fantastic. That's good work. Good work. 
Good work from all concerned. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. Well, one of the benefits of our Patreon subscription is that uh, we get to go through your record collection on a Zoom. And uh, having done that, uh, the next year you can come on our, our podcast as a guest and uh, chuck in uh, a, an, an agenda item to be discussed. And we yes. have uh, Rob Collis with us. So, Rob, what? Uh, happy birthday, first of all. And what's your... Um, What's the thing you? What's what's uh, what's uh, what's what would you want to get off your chest? <laughs> Funny enough, I wrote it down, but I typed it. Uh, it was what do you think was the best either uh, example of the uh, rock stars making movies, things like David Essex in That'll Be the Day, or David Bowie in The Man Who Fell to Earth, going right back to the fifties with Little Richard. Um, there's so many of them. And it's difficult to make a comparison, obviously. Who who do you think are the are the, the standouts then? <laughs> well, there are so many. I've watched the recent, most recent ones, Elton John and uh, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, and I really enjoyed them because it does help if you like the artists. Um, but the drop, I look back for me because of my age. I'm seventy six, and the the age I look at, the girl can't help it. Where you had Little Richard, the Platters, and uh, it it told tore a story of the times, if it ought to mean. Uh, and you had an entirely white group audience all sitting around these lovely pristine tablecloths, and uh, whereas a black artist were performing, you know, and it was it, it was great to see because it was my beginning of my music, so it, you were tainted a bit that way. You want to lean towards that, but I don't know if you remember Alan Freed, the famous boy. Of course you do. Yeah, yeah. Of, and well, I don't remember him, but go on. Yeah, it, it was a great documentary film about him. And Chuck Berry was in it, people like that. And that was very, there's an eye open because it wasn't a happy ending. You know, it was factual, which is unusual. No Hollywood ending. But well, you know. I, I suppose it's interesting that so many of those things, particularly in the 50s, were first delivered to people via films rather than television, wasn't it, really? That's how people saw those people for the yeah. first time. Um, now, I thought you were, I, I thought you were asking about people in rock stars acting and so forth but you're, you're talking about more yeah. people on the, on the big screen best actor and best film <laughs> it's like the oscars isn't it right uh, best film so can that include uh, hard day's night or uh, uh, no, it's all it's all it's all because there's a really good example that's pretty much how america apart from that's how america got to see the beatles in proportion didn't they that was rather on a, on a small screen oh, well <laughs> We, um, I saw a Joe, I think it was Crazy World or something. Joe Brown was in it. Crazy, I think it was called Crazy World or something. What a crazy world we're living in. I remember I saw that. I'm down the dog track. Mum was playing bingo. Uh, sisters caught in on the sofa. You want to hear the springs go? Yes, there you <laughs> go. Oh, right, yeah. that, they, that takes me back to the glory days of It's Trad Dad. Oh, yeah. From 1961 or 62, starring probably Kenny Ball and the Jazz. Kenny Ball and, the Paramount, and his Paramount Jazz Band. Uh, or, or was it Acker Bilk and his Paramount Jazz Band? Yeah, okay, got it wrong. Uh, Kenny Ball and the Jazz Band, Acker Bilk and his Paramount Jazz Band. Probably Chris Barber as well. Probably had Sam Costa in there somewhere. <laughs> That'd take you back. I'll tell you back to the days of Macmillan. <laughs> well, that, that go on. Crazy, and they had Susan Maugham. Susan really, Maugham, indeed. She wants to be Bobby's girl. I always felt that I had to refuse her, though, because I... You know, I right, right. <laughs> well, yeah, there's loads of, loads of golden memories, I suppose, of, you know... I, I I still remember seeing Elvis Presley, really. I used to go and see Elvis Presley films in the... You know, very oh, early 60s. <laughs> terrible, terrible films, but they had Elvis in them, you know, and you, there you were looking at Elvis, this kind of glowing god. He was nine foot tall on the screen, and that was a huge part of the appeal. Yeah. Well, that's the Susan Maugham thing made me laugh because she, in my opinion, was the female equivalent of Dick Van Dyke. You know? Okay. Oh, Joe, Joe. And you know that she's, she doesn't speak like that at all. What, the terrible English accent? You oh, right, right, right. right. She, I mean, she was awful, but, I mean, it doesn't... It, I mean, I, I just... this I could sit and watch musical films or films with music, whichever one I look at it, constantly. It's a great I thought joy. David Essex was pretty good, actually, at the time. Yeah. I wasn't happy with the second one, but the first one was... No, the uh, first one was but, great. But listen, the great thing about all this is here we sit, all these years... 
past the events that we're talking about. And absolutely every one of these is available to view on YouTube tonight in some shape or form. You can sit, you can just wander down memory lane endlessly, you know. And that's probably what I'll end up doing as a consequence of this. I'll go and look, I'll go and looking for Susan Morm. I'll probably find, I'll probably find Frank Ifield in the opening of Up Jump to Swagman, where he walks, <laughs> where he walks across. And I do recommend this to absolutely everybody. He walks across, uh, Trafalgar Square wearing one of those Australian hats that has the kind of brim up at the side. And I think he's actually singing, right? You've got to guess. What is he singing? In order to waltzing Matilda. (laughs) In order, in order to register safely the idea that he's an Australian, and here we are. That's belt and braces, isn't it? We were simple souls in those days. So that's my nomination, Rob. Frank Ifield in Up Jump to Swagman. There you go. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! The Word Podcast, walking the digital dog since two thousand and seven. Well, thanks very much to birthday guest Rob, and also our earlier guest Rob Fitzpatrick. It's been all the Robs this time. We're joined by Alex Gold. Hello, Alex. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, and let's just recap the important reasons why people, if they're not already Patreon supporters, might care to join our merry band of Patreon supporters. Alex, just run down the many benefits for their benefit. Well, first of all, you uh, are granted access to our weekly quiz. Oh, uh, Friday come- evenings. Every- Friday evenings will never be the same again. Weekend officially. It's a sensational best. moment, by the way. There are people all over the world, all over the yep. globe, meeting up at 6 o'clock on Friday's UK <laughs> time. Take part in a very entertaining and not wildly challenging quiz. <laughs> In the words of Tony Hancock in the Radio Ham, with, with these headphones, I've got friends all over the world. None in this country, but friends <laughs> all over the world. <laughs> anyway, so that's the Friday night quiz. Alex, what else? Is uh, You get early access to our podcasts, our video content, and also ad-free. Um, Absolutely. Continued uh, listening pleasure experience. Um, you also uh, get uh, priority access, priority tickets, um, early access to our live events. So when we have tickets on sale, you get first dibs. And that'll be returning the new year. Indeed it will. And you also get the best birthday present it's possible for anybody to have. It is. Mark and Dave coming to digitally rummage around your record collection. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a Zoom where you can go through all the records that have meant the most to you. Hold them up and talk about them. It's very and good And we, we could have a good laugh at them, you know. Yeah. So that, that, <laughs> that's what we do. Uh, and so if you... And we've got various to... things we've been doing recently we should plug, shouldn't we? There's a Jenny Boyd uh, podcast. Jenny Boyd, terrific. Oh, my goodness me. Who is married to Mick Fleetwood and big Mark, miles with... Listeners, well, listeners, Mark ellen has got a bit of a crush on <laughs> In fact, to be fair, he's had a crush on, crush on Jenny Boyd from about 90, since about 1968. This is true. It's only recently he's managed to managed to meet her, <laughs> albeit via Zoom. Um, She's good she, value. She was fantastic. We love her. We do yeah. love her. And Who Ken else? Womack was also Which, very, very good. Ken, who's old pal of the pod, who's written various books about, 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 about terrific uh, two-parter about George Harrison, but he's written George Martin, sorry. But he's written a brilliant book about Mal, Mal Evans, the, the Beatles roadie, gopher, chauffeur and right-hand man. Very good. So that's all out there on our YouTube channel or a you know, podcast via your normal suppliers. We try to be... We try to move in mysterious ways. We try to... You know, we're, we're out there in, uh, in all kinds of different shapes and forms. And so do make sure, you know, that you... Uh, subscribe where appropriate and like wherever possible because that really does make a difference doesn't it alex it does yeah every, every little helps every every little um bit of the uh, like like it and commentary we get it's uh, is all very very helpful indeed absolutely so that's about it for this week say goodbye everybody this podcast was brought to you by the word hey.